Good evening, everyone. Hi, my name is Larry Gallagher. And on behalf of MIT Video Productions and MIT Music and Theater Arts, I'd like to welcome you to this very special program. I'd particularly like to welcome MIT's president and first lady, Raphael and Chris Reif. <laughs> and of course, our very special guest, Jacob Collier. <laughs> Jacob's residency last fall at MIT is the subject of the documentary that we're about to screen. Following the screening, Fred Harris, the director of MIT's Wind and Jazz Ensemble, will moderate a brief Q&A session uh, that is going to include key contributors to the film and the concert. The evening's program will conclude with a special performance by Jacob. <laughs> so Jean Dunoyer, the film's director, will introduce the film in just a moment. But first, I'm very pleased to introduce MIT's president, Raphael Reif. Well, good evening, everyone. Just, there was no way I was gonna miss this evening. No way, three reasons. One is, never in my life I've been invited to a movie premiere. <laughs> this is my shot, and I was not gonna miss that. That's number one. Number two, I really wanted to meet uh, Jacob Collier. Very much wanted to meet him. I've heard so much about him, and I wanted to hear about himself and about his music and about what he did at MIT. And, uh, and I also heard that he has claimed that MIT is his second home. So I want to come here to say, welcome back home, Jacob. <laughs> and there is a third reason. There is one other reason why I wanted to be here. And that is to recognize one of the most special talent of MIT at MIT. This is a fellow who is known in some circles as the Ken Burns of MIT. Do you know who I'm referring to? I'm talking about Mr. Larry Gallagher. I think, I think all of you know, all of you I'm sure know, that Larry and his MVP team, uh, they got an Emmy Award over the summer for his documentary, A Bold Move, that describes the move of MIT from Back Bay to Cambridge. And that was not it. That was his second Emmy Award because the same team got an Emmy Award a few, a few, a couple of years ago. Both of them very richly deserved. So I want you to take this opportunity, Larry, to say to you thank you for telling the MIT story with so much care, love, and elegance. And to your team, the MVP team, for all the terrific work they do for MIT. Thank you so very much and congratulations. <laughs> Well, um, can you hear me? It's a thrill to be here. It's a thrill to be uh, sharing this film with you tonight. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Raphael, for those very kind words. Um, I, uh, this, this is really a passion project. So it was extraordinary to spend all this time with so many people, uh, many of which are in this room tonight, who have so much energy uh, to create. And, and, and I think that that energy for, for creation and doing it in a collaborative way is, is kind of a, a way for us to you know, uh, enjoy our lives as to, to the fullest. And so I think this project was definitely that for me and I hope for all, all the others who are here tonight and the audience. And um, also, uh, to make docu documentary films, the hardest part is funding them. And so I wanted to uh, give my gratitude to Neil and Jane Papalardo who have given uh, MIT Video Productions the space to create to uh, tell the incredible stories that are uh, going on every day at MIT. And uh, so we get a chance to uh, pick those stories. And tonight, you get to see one of them. So I hope you like it. And I'm, I'll be here afterwards. If you have any questions or you want to hear me talk about the film, I could go on forever. <laughs> All right, enjoy the show. And it's about to start.
we are making music with one of the most talented people I've ever met, uh, named Jacob Collier. So you go, you don't wanna be my savior. You don't, especially when you don't wanna be my savior. In the music world, Jacob's huge, you know, and, and so in some ways for him to get to work with all these musicians, it's the best thing. We were able to get him to come to MIT and kind of do a week-long residency. MIT's Visiting Artists program is trying to bring great artists in substantive contact with our students. It's all about music education experiences. I wanted them to feel the sparks of Jacob's creativity firsthand. And I wanted them to go beyond that, to get inside his music and to be able to make it their own. For this kind of thing, it's all you really need is like, it's like a... More than like... You, know, you could even find like a... I mean, I like do your own thing, but you could find a riffy thing that's just kind of like... You know what I mean? And just like... Because I guess the guitar is like basically a drummer here, as opposed to being a hard instrument. He creates a really great atmosphere for working with people and bringing the best out of them. Mega, dude, that sounds amazing. It's a creative environment and that really feeds me. Their minds are obviously so sharp. You know, and it's not even necessarily musically sharp in the foreground, but these guys think about stuff. There's this gig on Saturday that if you don't have tickets to, I believe there's a waiting list, but you should come. It's going to be so crazy. 200 musicians on the stage. I'm performing with Jacob Collier, which is amazing. Music, it like sends chills up my spine, especially Hideaway. Like, that's my favorite song. A sense of peace, a sense of calm, and something making sense. When I started listening to the music, I realized this was a lot more complicated than most arranging projects. As a music nerd, it's a beautiful looking score to me because there's all these things that didn't appear like they should be there from the beginning and they start to show up. His music is in many ways like classical music, which is that so much of it is specified. Take me anywhere you want to go. You know that my It's pretty moving for some, well, Hideaway especially. There are certain points in the music where it's pretty overwhelming. So like the call So he states the melody, he sings the melody. It's all very tonal and pretty and like a pop song. And then we get to the bridge and suddenly he throws us for a loop. In
toss me like I've never loved before in a place that I The drummer has one of the hardest things of all. He's got to play the fives on the cymbal, but still maintain the slow four with his foot. In the second verse, he adds this layer of fives. So, and it's made more complex by the fact that the fives are grouped in fours and threes and sixes. You know, you don't hear the math of it when you're listening to the song. You, you just suddenly become unmoored in this kind of dreamlike state, and yet you still hear the slow pulse from the original part of the song. He's kind of playing with this notion of you, the listener, thinking you know where you are, and he'll throw something at you that unmoors it, but without completely divorcing you from the structure that you knew before. revelation it's amazing and all of this is happening you know in what at the beginning seemed to be a simple four chord pop song <laughs> this is kind of what our lives are like is that we try to reduce them so that we can get through the day but there's stuff going on that if we just pay attention to it is beautiful, inspiring, frightening. And he's kind of encapsulating all of this in, in a five or six minute song that appears to be a pop ballad at the beginning. wanted to hear in music because it's so intricate and detailed but it's purposeful it, like he has a purpose for everything he does every note he hits every weird beat that he plays <laughs> 
What my mum did is recognize that I had some kind of weird brain that was very thirsty and very inventive and quite emotionally um, mature and presented lots of different things to me. Like, this is Bach, this is Stravinsky, this is Bartok, this is Britain, this is Earthman and Fire, this is Bob McFerrin, this is Sting. Those are like a lot of my heroes growing up. Um, um, and, I, and I wasn't told to do anything with them. I was just told to enjoy them. She used to do things like turn on the vacuum cleaner, or as we say in the UK, the Hoover, and plug it in, it would go... And she said, Jacob, what does that feel like? This is when I'm two, two years old. I was like, gee? I said, yeah, it's a G. Really, the biggest gift I was given as a child was a space and the affirmation to create in it. I was never, ever taught to practice, ever. I was never taught to practice. And people don't believe that. No, no way, no way. Where's the discipline? This kind of thing. And, and, and it's funny because it's true, but people have an idea of how to learn and how to teach that I think is horrifically out of date. <laughs> At the beginning of her Django, the first thing you hear is the strings come in, and yeah. it's like the announcing of the new song. Yeah. So I call it the change of texture for that. That's cool. T do you want to do those edits? You can plug in the speakers and do those edits. Well, I'd love that, yeah. yeah. Can we plug in a microphone? Yeah. Oh, sweet. I saw one of his videos on YouTube, and I thought, oh my gosh, this guy's amazing. He's got this great sense of aesthetics and editing skills and mixing and all these things. And I like to build music tech stuff. And so I sent him a Facebook message saying, I'm at MIT, I make stuff. Have you got any ideas of stuff you'd like to make? And I said, oh, well, yes, I have. I've always dreamed of singing harmony on the spot, you know, be able to essentially improvise a choir. Sing it in the light, I take these broken wings and learn to fly oh. A harmonizer takes whatever you're singing and there's a keyboard and you can play different notes and the notes that you play are transformed so that what you sing is spread across lots and lots of notes. It basically multiplies his voice up and stacks. Because this is like woodwind and then sax. Those sounds go together, don't they? Yeah. I'm going to be creating this kind of improvised, harmonic, more spontaneous, technological, musical compound piece where I can send the musicians information during the performance 
via maybe iPad screens or something like this, where I say, you play these notes now, and they, they play and it swells up and swells down, and then I can fill in the gaps, and it, it's, it's like a big conversation. And this is one of the main pieces of work that will be done between now and December. I think I, on I think stage, you, well, you'll need one laptop that'll be the MIDI input. Okay. And that'll have a keyboard. Each open up a web page on our phone, and there's a staff. So he's picking all of these different notes, chords, rhythms, everything for every different instrument, and we're playing them as they come up on our screen. It's allowing Jacob to literally play the band in real time. Engineer too, so I like to tinker. I like to explore things, and um, one of my best laboratories is 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 with music. So uh, I think, if anything, Jacob has made us into uh, bolder, risk more risk taking experimentalists. I learned perhaps more about how it's best not to learn and not to teach than how to learn and how to teach. Don't give people all the answers to things. If you give people all the answers, then they are the subject to your criteria. But if you give them all the questions and the clues, then they find their own answers. And actually, the process of finding an answer is almost all of learning. So I think teachers have a responsibility to trust their students to find not only answers, but their own answers that might be different from the teacher's answers, especially when it comes to something like jazz, which is so vague and so expressive and personal. <laughs> For like for the section where mm -hmm. it goes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I could be there like with the class. Mm -hmm. Just to give them the rhythm there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. At what stage of the process do you write the lyrics to the song? Um, it depends. Sometimes it's the first thing that I write. I write a lot. I write. I have a thought book that's filled with words, really dense imagery, like really interesting, dense imagery. And when I come to write lyrics, I try and write as little of it as I can, because the music is already complex, and I, I need to allow people to find their own meanings in the words. Like the song Hajango, it's just a number of seven syllable lines. Everybody near and far, come together as you are, and to the ocean, to the sky, sing that cosmic lullaby. That could mean lots of different things. That could mean life and death. It could mean a simple song that your mother sings to you before you go to sleep, it could mean the actual universe, like lots of different things. I'd rather write words that invite people to understand them rather than project my understanding onto other people. Just 
probably busy this whole week, but if you ever find like an hour and you want to go grab a pint anywhere, <laughs> you're sick. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Are you gonna be are you coming on Saturday? I am. Just find me after the okay. find me after the show. All I'll right. be hanging out. All right, yeah. fantastic. Cool. All right. Nice so, to meet you. Yeah, yeah, so nice to meet you too. Pleasure. Yeah, see you soon. Thank you. Cheers. Nice to meet you. See you later. I really feel like MIT is a sort of second home in some ways. I've always very much felt some kind of kinship with this kind of idea of celebrating the introvert. At MIT, it's a sort of sublime understanding of the people who think inwards first. And I would count myself in uh, amongst that group of people, so I'd like to celebrate that idea, I think. And um, being at MIT consistently reminds me how wonderful it is when people think beyond this level and up and down into the other realms of things. So um, I'd like to sort of say thank you to MIT as a concept. <laughs> going and the bass is going it's cool right it's like it's more cool than because they have a gravity that goes towards the same place but they don't have a unison line let's try a different groove this is a groove that's hard to nail but it's the groove on the on the on the record and it's, it's like like a little groove so it's it, it's it's less of a shuffle and it's like halfway between a shuffle and a normal groove. So this is straight, and then this is triplet. And it's like halfway between, like this. It's less about putting the hi-hat later, it's more about bringing the snare earlier. So it's like If I, actually, if I, if I play and then you guys can join in, maybe that's a good way to get the feel. carefully and deliberately swings it in certain ways and, and modulates the time and pulls and pushes in a way that just gets this like really visceral groove where you just like get into it so much. That little bit of extra effort to you know, change it makes such a difference. And that's you know, such a, a Jacob kind of construct is like that extra bit of intention that just you know, even just a tiny little breath or a tiny little extra note or something that doesn't quite, you know, fit in what the rules say they're supposed to do. Well, so, at the end, were you guys, did, had you guys split into two sections and were you singing different things? Some of them were singing, I don't want to be a leader, and the other one was going, I You don't want to be a leader? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We could do girls versus boys. It could be so like, I don't want to be, and then, you don't want to be my, you know what I mean? Put your hand in the air if you'd be willing to sing along in this next song with me. And by that, I mean everybody raise your hand. This is a song called Saviour. It's the last tune of the night. Thank you so, so much for coming. This must be what Quincy Jones felt when he first encountered Stevie Wonder or Michael Jackson. That here's someone who has really, really deep musical resources. Is marshalling this at a young age. He has phenomenal performance skills, arranging skills, composition skills. It's just incredible that all this exists in a single person. <laughs> She's never gonna love me. Oh, yeah. 
You say that I'm a lost now. Performs is enthralling. I can't even begin to imagine his potential. I mean, he's only, what, 22? I just think all of us are so incredibly lucky. We're gonna stop at this side of the road. Are you guys ready? once-in-a-lifetime kind of people that changes the way you look at things. It's really inspiring. It makes me think that there's real divinity in the world. This is what Jacob's uh, spirit does. I mean, it just, he makes you happy uh, yeah. in so many deep ways. Can I just get a quick show of hands of how many people were involved in that whole residency, whether you're a musician or you were behind the scenes? Raise your hand if you were involved in some way or another. Raise it high. Yeah.
thank you so much, because this really started as a dream that grew and grew and grew, and it was fabulous. Uh, we're going to have give the, ch the audience a chance to ask questions of all these amazing people, um, but I want to say one thing. And I've always been in awe of the ephemeral nature of music, it's uh, of live performance, because once you do it, it's done. You can never recapture it quite the same way again. And uh, this always makes me exhilarated, but it always makes me sad. So that what I find is that after really good concerts, I'm rather depressed for a while, <laughs> usually an hour or two. After this concert, weeks I was depressed. <laughs> so I thank you all for that great feeling of depression. Uh, <laughs> We're going to do this uh, Q&A, and I think you know everybody, but I just want to introduce. First and foremost here is Jamshid Sharifi, class of 83. <laughs> we might get some questions about this, but Jamshid is a, is a fantastic composer and arranger, producer. He was... Um, the director of the MIT Festival Jazz Ensemble for seven years, took it on after he uh, graduated. And he had the incredible, I still don't know how he did it, task of not only transcribing Jacob's music, but arranging it for very large forces. So Jamshid Sharifi. Then, yes. <laughs> of course, you've already met Jean Dunoyer, our wonderful film director and editor. And of course, the brilliant and ever innovative media mastermind of MIT and well beyond, Ben Bloomberg. <laughs> and of course, the magical Jacob Collier, whose capacity for creativity with heart knows no limits. Jacob. So here's your chance. Anybody has a question? We just ask you come down. There's a mic on either side. Any question of any of these folks would be great uh, to have. Hi. I have a, an, a really exciting editing question, okay. if there's such a thing. Uh, for Jacob and for uh, the filmmaker, how do you take something like that, like all that happened, and be and to make to be concise as a filmmaker, and not make it a Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movie with nine and en nineteen endings, and uh, like I, is there a part of it like letting go? And also, I guess with arranging uh, your music with all these people, and it could be like a ten hour long concert. So how do you, mm -hmm. like, how much of it is letting go of what of attachments and stuff like that to make the whole thing better? All right, yeah, I, I can handle, handle that question. Um, so really what it is is you, you spend a lot of time looking at your footage and you're, you're looking for the, for the peaks, for the real like moments when everything's kind of coalescing perfectly. And when you're making film, there's always some things that just fall off the edge that just don't work at all or, or you know, that great shot you wanted just didn't happen. And, and so you, you really look at your footage to, to concentrate the energy on the bits that really fly. So we had... In the case of the rehearsal, for example, we had, um, you know, I, I ended up boiling it down to about 20 minutes of, of rehearsal, and I loved all of it. Um, but, you know, once I get to that point, then, then I've, I've decided I like those 20 minutes, and then I just kind of choose the bits that, that illustrate what might have happened before and after, uh, in terms of the song that you're hearing before or after, you know, in performance. So those are kind of some, some of the thought processes that I go through uh, uh, with editing. It's really about like, like finding the nectar, you know, squeezing it to the, to the maximum. I don't know if Jacob wants to add something. Yeah, I, I, can, I can relate to that for sure. Um, I think for me, when it comes to making music, um, there's always the, the sorrow of, of letting go of a good idea, right? It's just very sad. Um, however, I, I've always had this idea, a, a slight uh, sort of mechanism for dealing with this kind of thing where I often record ideas on, on voice memos. So it's like, and I, I whisper to myself like how to create it, how to manifest from that, from that point, and all sorts of things. I then take that idea and put it in a timeline view. I then cut it up and color code it in sort of gold, silver, and bronze ideas. 
And bronze ideas are like filler. Um, and in my case, those are sometimes quite extreme already. Um, silver ideas are, kind of, are the moments that make you go, whoa, that's crazy. And then gold moments are like mic drop moments, you know? <laughs> and and, and my, my challenge is, is always to have, have the patience and, and trust the listener to leave the gold ideas to the end because I want to do them all at once. Um, and I've always had a, 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 a sort of love and, and my, my intuition has always found that doing everything at once is really fun. And the older I get, um, you know, now, now, now I'm all grown up. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I, I think yeah, I'm, I'm learning that, um, you know, it's, it's that tricky thing of the more you know how to do, um, the more courage it takes not to do it all um, at once. But, but the more you have the, that, that said courage, um, the greater the, the sort of depth of the, of the end result or something. So, you know, I think it's a process of understanding your own process. For me, it's about letting everything come out. Everything needs to come out, all the ideas, all of the visions, all of the various things that, that one juggles in the creative process. I think that if you don't let that come out, then there's something that is never going to be done as a result, bless you. Um, <laughs> and, and so everything, everything comes out, and then one needs the, the courage to deal with each thing as it is, and then to place it where it needs to be placed, if that makes any sense. Jacob, uh, given whatever preconceived notions you had about MIT, and you know, we all had them before we came and discovered what MIT is all about, Given those preconceived notions, what surprised you most about interacting with these wonderful students? Yeah, yeah, um, fantastic question. So, I mean, I've, I, I feel like I, I had scratched the surface of, of what MIT was all about because I've been hanging with Ben for a, a while, um, or I guess a year, if that's a while. Um, <laughs> two years, two years. Um, and, you know, I think I was, you know, I, I was expecting some, some, some fun and I was expecting some, some innovation, uh, but the, the kinds of, the, 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 the um, the quality of the brilliance of the minds was just blew me away. At the moment I came in, and I came in in September, right, um, and sort of dipped my toe in. And I think that's where we got some of the rehearsal footage was from that initial rehearsal time. And it's like these guys are just alive, you know. And when you see, when you look someone in, in the eye, and their eyes are going, it's just <laughs> that that I connect with that so much, and it's wonderful. And you know, and, and often with collaborations, and especially with teaching, you know, you come to these institutions to teach whatever that happens to mean. And there are these sort of these students with no eyes sort of looking at you in the audience. And, and, but here, it's like everyone's just ready. They're just they're thirsty and ready, and, and they're like sponges. So you, know, you say an idea once, and it sticks with everybody. And that's so rare. I can't tell you how rare that is. Um, and, and then, you know, obviously, when, when you rehearse, it's exciting. And when you arrange and discuss, it's exciting. But when, you, when, when everyone gets on that stage, no one really knows what's going to happen. You know, me and, me and Fred had discussed it at length the different sections. And, the order of the songs and, and things, but things change so fast, and then you're taken by surprise. And I think that, you know, for, for a collective group of people who are perhaps used to organizing things in frameworks and understanding that things happen in a certain order, and, and you know, th these are the sort of the, the greatest science and maths brains of, of, of our generation. But then, you know, you could drop a bomb and then people will respond. And I think that was something I wasn't expecting at all, but something I was elated to find. You're welcome. Uh, this is for Jacob. Um, so you've obviously used like extensive music technology, and you're here because you're like pushing the limits of it. What kind of uh, music technology do you have like musical visions for in the distant future for the tech that's like not even close? And also, oh, second question: uh, Do you want to grab a pint after this? <laughs> <laughs> on, on me. On me. Um, thank you very much. Uh, to, yeah, to, to the latter is a, is a yes. Um, <laughs> to the, all right, so yeah, see you there. Um, to, to, to the former, I, I guess Ben and I can answer this question together. Um, yeah, so when, when Ben sent me this Facebook message, it was very thrilling uh, for me. Um, and actually, it was, it was serendipitous that I even saw it because I, I tend to stay clear of Facebook messages. Um, <laughs> you know, because it's a minefield. And, you know, you, you never know what weird stuff you're going to find. And just, it just so happened that one day out of you know, in three or four weeks, I decided to check them out. And on the top of the pile was, you know, Ben, ben Bloomberg. And so I just clicked on his name. And, and then there was this, this, I mean, it wasn't long. It was a short paragraph. It basically just said, I mean, you can probably say better than I can. But basically just said, you know, I've, I've, I've just seen a video of yours. And, and I think it's, it's, it's exciting. And, and I, I just, I create things. I love to create things. And to me, that was like, well, that's me as well. I love to create things. Um, but, but Ben likes to create sort of digital live performance flavored things. Um, and, and yeah, it was, I guess, as you saw in the documentary, it was kind of like, do you want to make anything? And 
the answer to that was, a, was an absolute yes. And, and we jumped on Skype and spoke for, I think, three, three hours. And it, and, and it was just like, you know, I've been waiting, how, how old was I at the time, 19 or 20? And I've been waiting 20 years for that conversation. <laughs> so it was, it was like, and, and ben, was just, ben was just astounding because, you know, it, it would be very easy just to say, well, you know, that's, that's a lot of stuff and, you know, that was fun. Uh, goodbye, you know, <laughs> sort of thing. Um, but, but, you know, but I, I think partly because a lot of the stuff just wasn't really possible. Um, and still, some of it still is not possible. And, and some of it has been made possible by Ben, um, which is just astounding. Um, and I guess the first thing, you know, I wanted to tour my room, right? I wanted to tour my room, which is not a conventional way of touring, because normally one would tour with a, a band. Um, but I wanted to tour with a room, and I wanted to be able to sing in, in harmony um, on the spot. Uh, do you want to explain a bit, a bit about the harmonizer and how we did it and how it works and yeah. that whole uh, shebang? I mean, it's. Um so it's, it's sort of all of our favorite sounds in one box. Um, and uh, there are a lot of other sort of approaches to you know, similar things like phase vocoders and, and all kinds of things out there. But um, first, thing, first thing Jacob said is, well, all the ones I can find only have four notes. And I want to play way more than four notes um, at a time. And so, so for the first thing we did was we started to try to figure out how to make one that could play a gazillion notes simultaneously. And, it was like, well, what if you, what if you know, I play a chord and then I want to keep that one going and then play something else on top of it? And so, um, so we came up uh, with with this thing actually, um, it's right there, um, which is a bunch of electronics and software and um, and some off the shelf stuff and some custom stuff and uh, and yeah, I guess I guess uh, that that was sort of the first thing we sat we sat together. We in did it in about a weekend. Uh, yeah. uh, Jacob came to Boston to visit and we put it all together and then. Uh, we started thinking about other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing challenge. It's, yeah. it's like, how do you, you know, as a human being, how can I make my creative process bigger without detracting from my humanity? That's the thing, isn't it? Because technology sort of, uh, steals <laughs> humanity sometimes, it stows it away in some yeah. invisible, dangerous place. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, for me, it's, it's that thing of, you know, if, if, I, if I had 11 arms or 12 arms, I, I would try and play the, all the instruments at once, but I don't. So. The only way to do it is to try and use our imaginations about how to achieve that. But the goal is is kind of like more human, rather than removed That's from human. human. Yeah. I think, and that's a, that's an aesthetic that we shared and share. Um, <laughs> moving forward, uh, there, there's so much to do um, yeah. in in the world of, of technology, but but it has to feel like it. You can touch it and you can feel it, and and the moment you touch it, it kind of gets you out of yourself. Because for me, those are the best creative processes. It doesn't matter whether it's a piano or a bass or a computer or something, it's like, if you touch it and it goes then, then you want to create into it. And so, yeah, the, I mean, we've got a yeah. bunch of strange projects that are flying around, <laughs> like the, this is the harmonizer and there's now soon to come the vocalizer, which is a dangerous uh, um, sample library made of voices that does <laughs> and various other things. Um, and then there is, yeah, we're trying to figure out a way to essentially uh, teach a computer how to um, navigate harmony uh, and then present to humans uh, the, the user interface with which they can interact using their own emotional criteria to navigate. So they don't have to be musicians to know that, you know, if you, if you add a <laughs> to that chord, it warms your heart up, you know. But if, if I can just put that in someone's hand, but, but they don't have to say, okay, it's an A minor chord and I'm adding a D, they, they can just say, I want to just go, and then they make it, make it <laughs> So. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a romantic idea, but we're, we're working towards it uh, piece by piece where we are going to tackle that. Um, I, think, I think a big challenge is, especially with the technology stuff, figuring out actually what the tech is good for and what, what Jacob is good for, basically. And so a lot of people build systems, especially for live performance, and you're trying to lean on the computer to do something that just a human is always going to do better. And, you know, maybe maybe 10 years, 20 years down the road, we'll have something that does it. But but when you look at it right now, and you're thinking about an experience for you know for people in an audience, um, you know, computers computers do certain things really really well, um, but we do certain things really really well. And so, sort of finding the optimal synergy there is is sort of what we're what we're excited about uh, working on. A, a computer is never going to follow a score, you know, as well as a human can. Um, at least in the next two and a half years, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know, so we'll, maybe we'll wait two and a half years, you know. But but it's um, 
it's uh, those are the, those are a lot of the kinds of decisions and 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 sort of philosophies that we think about. Um, you know, sort of, yeah. Where where can we apply the technology in a way where it's actually it's actually doing something that it's you know that helps that that makes the, the performance more musical. So your uh, analogy, your uh, anecdote with the vacuum cleaner reminded me of this. Um, so. In pieces like uh, In the Bleak Midwinter and Fascinating Rhythm, you display this microtonally perfect sense of perfect pitch. Um, how much of that was just something you've always had, and how much of that was developed? Uh, yeah, interesting question. So, so perfect pitch um, is it's, it's just it's, it's, a, it's a kind of memory, really. It's, it's being able to recall a sound. Um, and I suppose the more I've recorded things uh, over the years, the more I've realized that this is not in tune. It's not in tune at all. Um, to, to very quickly demonstrate, if you if you take a major try, I mean you guys know this because this is like Pythagoras figured this stuff out, right? But but like um, you know, on, on the piano, the major this is a, a G major chord, and the major third is actually 14 cents too high, which means 14 14 hundredths of a semitone. So the correct one is like it's like that out of tune. But like I I, I realize this, and it's like. How does no one know this stuff, man? Like, it's crazy. It's like a, a hoax. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I, I, just, I just strive to sing more in tune um, and had to disregard computers and knowing better than I did because I had to learn about how to tune chords by ear. Um, and then suddenly it's like, well, my perfect pitch declines that B because it's not A440. And then suddenly you learn that there's no reason why 12 keys are this, this the limit. There are more. Um, and then, yeah, so for example, in the, in the Bleak Midwinter, where I go to G half sharp in the fourth verse, it's like just a voyage into a key that is slightly fresher to everybody's ears. Um, de yeah, definitely mine, because I kind of got bored of the normal ones, so I <laughs> thought it'd be fun to try things out. But, you know, I think it's, you know, it's a matter, I mean, anybody with a skill set, I'm sure you guys can relate to this, but, you know, you, you, have your, you have your skills that you use on a regular basis, and then once those get tired, it's to do with, you know, knowing how to gather in a way that's not going to disrupt what you already have, but is going to push you and, 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 and stretch your imagination and, and your creative strengths. And I, I just think for me that the microtonal thing was a bit of a game that for a while, and I'm still into it, that there, there was a while where I was really into it and you know, voices going, you know, instead of, it was just, it was interesting for me because voices need to move. That's, that's it. That's, that's the gesture, movement and arrival. And if you arrive in a satisfying place, it doesn't matter how you get there. So microtones or no microtones, it still does the job. So it's just a nice thing to think about, you know. It's it's a, it's another example of just thinking in, in between the gaps of details and finding that there's magic in the things that aren't quantized. By which I mean everything's the same, you know. Like if I play a groove into Logic that's like this, and then I quantize it and it goes, it's like it, it's it's fine and it's accurate and you know techno guys are going to dance well to that, but <laughs> but. But it's, it, you know, it's lost, it's, going back to your question, it's lost some of its humanity because the computer squeezed the humanity out of that. So, you know, Samba, for example, like, like that, the groove there, it's not straight, it rolls like an egg, you know? And like once you get, get to learn that, it's like, oh, so that's not accurate then. This is just one potential thing. All the symptoms don't have to be the same size. You can go in between and you can stretch things around. Like, yeah, I mean, I could talk for a long time about this, but the, the, <laughs> the, the basic premise is that things that are perfect just gen generally aren't, uh, are, are, are neither perfect nor moving. And so it's just nice to push as much as you can the things that we believe to be straight and correct into places that have a more, bit, more of, bit more potential for unfamiliar emotional language. That makes any sense? You might be the only person other than Jacob with Hajanga who has arranged Jacob's own music for forces beyond just Jacob alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if that's true, but anyway. It might good. be close to being I true. I think it's close to being true. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So how was that process? <laughs> you, you actually know. <laughs> I do, but they don't. Um, when I started on, the, on the, the business of arranging Jacob's music, uh, Within about an hour, I realized that I was not going to be able to, to really understand what was going on inside of it. So I called up you guys and, and asked for the multi-tracks. In other words, 
for the versions of the songs in which every element was isolated so that I could hear them in isolation and try to figure out what was going on. And even with that, I mean, Ben sent me sessions that were about 60 tracks wide, but a single track would have, I mean, it would be labeled yeah, guitar, and it would have 12 <laughs> guitars in it. <laughs> um, so there was an incredible density in all of this. Um, and uh, I mean, typically I'll spend two or three days on a, on a good sized arrangement, on an arrangement for orchestra. And all of these for Jacob were at least eight or nine days because there was so much decoding and understanding and really reorienting myself to what I thought I knew about music. Because you were doing, I mean, you're, you're saying this, but I'm, I'm verifying you're doing stuff that I've never seen before, that I've never seen people consider in terms of the way harmonies are put together, in, in terms of the way the time was, um, because it definitely wasn't quantized, and yet it grooved its ass off. And I, I was trying to figure out, how is this all working? Um, so uh, yeah, there, there were days of what I'll just call decoding and analysis, of trying to f understand where, where it was coming from. And then taking that and, you know, and, and putting it on paper so that us mortals could read it. Uh, it, it, was, it was revelatory. It was really enjoyable and, and eye-opening, but yeah, yeah it, it was a revelation. I still feel that and, and feel it more here, you know, hearing the pieces again. Um, there's so much in what you're doing that, it is, that it's at a level I've never seen before. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you so much. Mm. We'll have one more question, I think. Hi. OK, so um, I was going to preface this by asking you if you have any problems. But the real question that I was going to ask is, um, what, what obstacles have you faced? Like, Because I know I personally suffer in my artistry from a lot of anxiety and a lot of like perfectionism paralysis thing. It's just like the, the philosophy of, well, I mean, if you're not going to do it right, then you shouldn't do it at all. Like, are there any major things that you either are currently working through or you have overcame to become such an expressive musician? That's a, that's a really wonderful question. Thank you. And a huge question as well. Um, man, that's why I said, do you, do you have any problems would be yeah, the best. Do you, yeah, <laughs> you have any problems? Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, so when I, when I go to restaurants and look at the menu, I cannot make a decision about what to okay, order. Okay, okay. Um, that's, that was it. Right. So, so I, th I think, so, okay, so, so to break this down to, into short sections, um, one is, is to do with the, the way that you learn and the reason that you learn it. And for me, as, as basically a self-taught musician, um, I didn't look to other people for the answers. Um, and so I... I, I guess I, I think I was brought up to very much trust my intuition to lead me in the right direction. And, and I think that I, I enjoyed the process of arriving at a place more than I did the place. Mm -hmm. Because when you get to a place, it's like, oh, okay, oh, okay, <laughs> done. You know, and, and for me, that's, that's always, it's kind of like what Fred was saying. It's like, you do all this glorious work to get to a place, and then you do the show, and it's gone, and it's a, bit, a little bit sad. Um, so for me, in terms of learning things, it's always just been about sort of in, instead of isolating a, a destination and then going there and achieving it, and the achieving of it being what keeps me alive, it's like the, the, the varying forms of nourishment that I'm subject to during the process of, of, of gathering a particular area within a framework of something, that, that process is something I really enjoy. But you know, I, I, I never really minded what other people thought of, of what I was doing, and, and I still don't really mind, actually. Uh, and so you know, the, the, the fact that now I'm... I'm making music and people are like li listening to it and coming to my shows and things. It's, it's absolutely wonderful, but um, it does truly feel like a bonus to a process that I so thoroughly enjoy that there'd be nothing that would stop me doing it if nobody was listening at all. Um, so I think you know, to, 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 to that end, um, you know, you, people, say, people say all sorts of things about, about people. You know, and so you can, you can be bruised by something that somebody says uh, about you or to you um, but only really if you, if you take what they, if, if you take their opinion as a method through which you can validate yourself. Um, and for me, 
I've always kind of been of the belief that I, I trust myself. I, I love my imagination so much. I just, I completely and utterly believe in it. Um, and it's not that I always get it right. It's just that being in there feels really good. And, and, and as a child, I just used to sit, you know, I could sit in a room just in heaven with nothing else other than just like, because my mind, because, you know, because my mind was, was just making all this stuff happen. Um, I'm, I'm sure many of you guys can relate to this, but one, one particular challenge is that you know, a, an overactive imagination in, in education is a difficult thing to handle and a difficult thing to be understood by those around you. And so you know, for me, it was always, Jacob, can you just do a bit less? Like, just, just play simple. Just, just, you know, you've got lots of good ideas, Jacob. Just one. One is enough. <laughs> and you know, so I played, I played drum kit in the concert band at school. And you know, on the part, it's like, and it's like, okay, well, and you know, and all these musicians just trying to play along with their part, and it's like, stop, Eric, stop, stop, stop. Okay, Jacob, less, less is more, less is more, and and it is that. It's that, it's that interesting thing of, of less is more because less is only more when you know what more is, you know? And then you can make a conscious decision to step back from that. And for, you know, for, for me, I, I think it's kind of like what I was saying earlier on. It's about you have to let yourself come out to be able to see, your, to, to be able to see yourself as raw elements, raw materials. And then you can make some creative decisions about what to do. But if you're, consci if you're, if you're constantly pushed back in the shell, not, not in terms of like in, in, in a very negative way, like you're bad or wrong, but more just like there's, there's too much that we can deal with right now. So go it back, just, 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 just wait till, you know, just right now, you just gotta play that groove, you know. Um, so I think for me as a, as a teenager, I just, I had trouble relating to the people around me that were telling me that things were correct and incorrect. And I think I've, I've learned since that, you know, music, thank goodness, is, is not, you know, it's not biology. For example, it, it's not a matter of life and death. It's really just lovely, um, and 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 the, the the point of music is to explore what it means to be expressive. And so there is not really such a thing as this is correct and this is incorrect. And I've never paid too much attention to, you know, this is the right note to put in the chord and this is the wrong note. Um, but I think I built. I've, I've as I said, I, I trust. I've trusted my intuitions um, enough to gather a sense of I, f I feel this is strong and this is weak in terms of. Emotion, you know, I, I'd maybe say that this voicing is not as strong as this voicing because I don't necessarily want to double the third, as Bach would say. And I, I later learned that Bach said, "Don't double the third in principle." Um, but you know, I think it's it's sort of going back to the, the original point. It's it's like, why do you do music? And why why do you do anything? And for me, the reason I do music is because I want to chase those goosebump moments. Um, the moments that just make me go like, oh, what is that? What is that sound? And how do I understand it? How can I achieve that myself? And, and you know, I, I looked around me as a teenager, and nobody else was <clears throat> thinking in those terms. So I just took on upon myself all the responsibilities of the band members, um, and, and gradually, you know, gradually gathered things. But one one problem I, I've had is that my my technique, my hands, uh, I've never ever been able to catch up with my head. Um, to the point where when I went to jazz college as an 18 year old for a couple of years, I was the kid in the class with no chops, but, but the ears. So I could hear everything that was going on. I knew the notes and the chords and, and why emotionally this one note was just so tender and stuff like that. Um, but I couldn't just play over Donna Lee at 300 BPM. I couldn't do that. Um, so you know, it was hard to explain why some things are valuable. It's, it's hard to explain why certain things are valuable, some underneath details. And I'm sure you guys and, and, and Jamsi, I'm sure, and absolutely Jean can relate to this because it's to do with when you create something, it's, it's tuning into all the different levels of gestures, right? It's the, the general gestures of it's this, and this is the beginning, and this is the end. Um, or it's loud and it's quiet, or it's bright and then it's dark. But, but you know, there are many gestures in between that are to do with. It, it's bright and it's heading towards brightness, but I'm not going to make it bright until later. And like that adds, suddenly it's added a, a dimension of intention <laughs> um, that, that I, I just really enjoyed as a, as a teenager. So having the patience to invest in those parts of your imagination is a challenge because it's, it's, fairly, glo it's kind of fairly generally misunderstood um, and or dismissed. So I think you know, there are always times in a person's life where you have to think, well, why, why am I doing this again? Why do I love this? And, why is it important to me? And 
And you know, if, if, for example, my left brain takes over, which it often does, you know, I'm sure some of you guys can relate to this thinking about thinking about thinking about thinking conundrum, right? And you know, that, that's a problem because it's what, what you described as sort of paralysis from analysis type situations where you're just tied up and, and you can't even see the wood for the trees anymore because you've lost perspective. And all of us as creative people can, I'm sure, relate to that, that thing where you tune so deeply into a part of a process that there's just no seeing it for what it is anymore. And that takes the courage to step away or get somebody else's opinion and not be defensive and all sorts of things. But, um, you know, I think it's, it's coming back to a place that belongs to you, a place in your mind that belongs to you and, and where your values are safe um, from others' judgment. Um, and, you know, I, yeah, I could, I, could, I could speak for a long time about this. One, one other thing I might quickly mention is that just touring was exhausting at first for me because I'm certainly an, 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 an introvert, so you know, concentrating all those li these, these little details, they kept me alive. Um, and touring, you know, funnily enough, no one really minds if it's like, or it just doesn't make much of a difference because everyone just wants to go, you know. <laughs> um, so at first it was like, oh, do you guys even care? You know, and, and then it's like, oh, I, now I understand that actually, it, you know, with, with communication, the gestures have grown. It, the importance of putting the foreground in the foreground has, has grown. And for me, when I, create things, I'm sure you guys would, would relate a little bit to this as well, it's like the background is in the foreground, you know, the, the underneaths are in the foreground because they're under the microscope. But when you perform, that is the foreground, you are the foreground. And I had to realize that it's the same energy that goes inwards, that goes outwards when one performs, but you just need to polarize the, the direction of that energy and then you're fine. And I didn't need to build a sort of Jacob the champion who does touring and excites people thing. It was just like, I just need to be myself, but in a, in a different direction. And so it's just like falling off a log. You know, you just right. sort of think, well, I'm going to be me today, and I don't really mind even if you like it very much, but it's just nice to see you. It's sort of yeah. attitude to touring. I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Place where, because I know you're a very busy person, but if you could, like, share a little bit more of your insights with me, when you find the time. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd out. very much enjoy that. Okay, yeah. great. It's a date. Just give me something. Okay. Cool. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. So we uh, we are certainly so grateful to have Jacob part of our community. We hope he continues to be part of our community. And uh, he's a, a world citizen these days, <laughs> along with Ben. And uh, we thought it'd be great to end with Jacob performing for us. Jacob Collier. I just need to uh, apply some tape to my face with the help of Mr. Bloomberg. So uh, meet the harmonizer. Um, he's a lovely beastie.
from glen to glen. I know the mountain song. The sun is gone. In It's you must go and love must go. But only love when someone is in the battle. Take me anywhere you want. You know that my love is strong. Softly, 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 like the golden dawn of a hollow stone. Find what I've been searching for, my 
your heart away. To the ocean, to the sky Sing that cosmic love Sing that love Sing that journey Like you'll never sing again. Let it echo loud and clear across the ancient strata da 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 There's a spark of joy that can be found Oh, we go when things break and fall apart Lift your hands up from the heart Singing on
Quand il va Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so, so much to... Um, thank you.
Thank you so, so much to Fred. Thank you to Ben. Thank you to Jamshi. Thank you to John. And thank you guys for coming along and being a part of this very, very special evening. I will not forget it in a, in a, in a, in a jiffy. Um, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll, I'll be thinking about this for a while. It's been very, very special. Thank you so much for coming and see you very soon. Thanks.